Hi, and welcome to AP Chemistry Exam Review. It's me, Dr. V, and I'm here to help you get ready for that AP Chemistry exam in May. So we're going to work today on free response question number one from the 2017 release exam. This was a long free response question, and like all the long free response questions in this course, it was scored out of 10 points. I do recommend that you try to work through the entire problem on your own. To do that, you'll need your calculator and a periodic table and your formula sheet. I always recommend that students try to do the problems first before they listen to my solution. That's really what helps you develop as a chemistry student. And then you can also keep track of your score and your own work as you go. So let's jump right in. Carbon tetrachloride, CCl4, can be synthesized according to this chemical equation given here. A chemist runs the reaction at a constant temperature of 120 degrees Celsius in a rigid 25.0 liter container. Okay, chlorine gas is initially present in the container at a pressure of 0 0.40 atmospheres. Okay, how many moles of chlorine gas are in the container? Now at this point, you should be thinking to yourself, hmm, I know the volume, I know what temperature, I know the pressure, I want moles. You should immediately think ideal gas law, PV equals NRT. All right, since I know the pressure and the volume and the temperature, all right, I can rearrange this equation to solve for moles, and then I can substitute in all my variables. R is the universal gas constant. I'm in atmosphere, so I'm going to use the version with atmospheres. I also need to make sure I put my temperature in Kelvin, and then it will give me an answer in moles. I get 0 0.31 moles. I've got two sig figs because there were two sig figs in my pressure, and we're good to go. That's what we needed to have for one point. You needed to have the supporting work and a correct answer. And then the question goes on, how many grams of carbon disulfide are needed to re completely react with this amount of Cl2? Well, we just calculated that it was 0 0.31 moles of chlorine gas. So we're going to go on and use that. All right, how much carbon disulfide do I need to react with the moles of Cl2? Okay, so we can look at the balanced equation. We see that there's one mole of CS2 for three moles of chlorine gas. So I'm going to use the mole ratio from the balanced equation and then the molar mass of CS2 and find the mass of the carbon disulfide. I do only get two sig figs because my going back to the original pressure that was reported with two sig figs. And this was worth two points. One point for correctly using the mole ratio and then one point for getting the correct answer. That would of course include having an appropriate molar mass. And then the question goes on, at 30 degrees Celsius, the reaction is thermodynamically favorable, but no reaction is, is observed to occur. However, at 120 degrees, the reaction occurs at an observable rate. Well, this to me, I immediately think activation energy as soon as I hear that, right? If it's nothing really happens at a lower temperature, but it proceeds at a higher temperature, usually that means that there's a very high activation energy. Well, okay, let's go on and actually look at the question. Explain how the higher temperature affects the collisions between the reactant molecules so that the reaction can occur at an observable rate at this higher temperature. All right, so here's what you need to be thinking of. At the higher temperature, the reactant particles have a higher average velocity and they have a higher kinetic energy, right? Because the temperature has gone up. So they're moving quicker, which means they're going to collide with each other more frequently. And it also means they're going to collide with each other with greater force. And those really are the points that you need to make for this question. Because of this, a higher proportion of collisions will have enough energy to get over that activation energy minimum, and therefore the reaction can proceed. So talking about the collisions more frequently and or more force when they collide is what you needed to write down to earn the point for this question. The focus for the scoring guide was really on the collisions. Okay, and then, oh, I see a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. The graph below shows a distribution for the collision energies of reactant molecules at 120 degrees at the higher temperature. Draw a second curve on the graph that shows the distribution for the collision energies of reactant molecules at 30 degrees, a lower temperature. Well, if the temperature is lower, the average speed will be lower. So we have to show that. And we also have to show that fewer particles will meet the activation energy minimum. So here's what your curve should look like. All right, notice that my peak is to the left of the peak that was originally drawn and beyond the activation energy line, my curve that I just drew in is lower than 
the curve that was originally given to me. And that's what you needed to have for the two points, those two aspects of the curve. All right, let's go on to the next part. S2Cl2 is a product of the reaction. In the box below, complete the Lewis electron dot diagram for this molecule by drawing in all of the electron pairs. So Lewis structures are absolutely a really important skill for AP chemistry students. And I always start by looking at the number of valence electrons in the molecule. So I've got two sulfur atoms. Each sulfur atom contributes six valence electrons for 12 from the sulfurs. And then each chlorine, it's contributing seven valence electrons. There are two of them, so that's 14, giving me a total of 26 electrons to play with. So when I go to draw my structure, and they already gave us the skeleton, I need to make sure that all 26 electrons are included, that everyone's got an octet, if I can make that happen, and that's really what I'm looking for. So I started with all single bonds, all right, um, between the atoms, and then I started putting in my other electrons and counting. So I started putting in the lone pairs, all right, all right, and so when I'm checking, I've got all 26 electrons represented, everybody's got an octet. This is actually the optimal structure for this molecule. You weren't asked to consider like, formal charges when you drew this. We were looking for all the electrons being there and it being an acceptable Lewis structure, and in this case, obeying the octet rule. Um, so other answers could be accepted, but this is really what we were thinking would be the best answer. All right, so then the question goes on. What's the approximate value of a chlorine sulfur to sulfur bond angle for the molecule that you drew? Okay, so I'm looking at the left-hand sulfur, which is, you know, equivalent to the right-hand sulfur, and I'm seeing that there are four electron domains around that sulfur, right? Two of them are bonded atoms, there are two lone pairs. But four electron domains, when two of the domains are occupied by lone pairs, I'm thinking a bent geometry which would have a bond angle of 104.5 degrees. Now they were actually a little more flexible in what they accepted for an answer here, but that's the answer I would expect my students to write down. And that's what you needed to write for one point. Again, if you had a mistake in your Lewis structure from part one of this section, your answer here for the angle needs to be consistent with that. So just make sure that they match. Okay, and then we're gonna switch gears a little bit. We can also make carbon tetrachloride by reacting trichloromethane with chlorine gas, all right, where the other product is hydrogen chloride gas. All right, so we've got this balanced equation. At the completion of the reaction, a chemist successfully separates the two products. We'll, we'll separate the carbon tetrachloride gas from the hydrogen chloride gas by cooling the mixture to 70 degrees. At this temperature, carbon tetrachloride condenses, but the HCl does not. All right. So we're asked to first identify all the types of intermolecular forces present in the liquid hydrogen chloride. Well, London forces, all matter can participate in London forces. That's always going to be in play. And because hydrogen chloride is a polar molecule, we also have dipole-dipole attractions. You needed to list both of, the, both of these to get the point here. Okay, and then what can be inferred about the relative strengths of the intermolecular forces in carbon tetrachloride and hydrogen chloride. Justify your inf answer in terms of the information that we're given. All right, so the fact that carbon tetrachloride condenses at 70 degrees, but HCl needs to get cooler, all right? So when the sample was cooled, the carbon tetrachloride condensed, but HCl did not, all right? And so the carbon tetrachloride condenses at a higher temperature than HCl, which means carbon tetrachloride would have a higher boiling point right? Because the temperature at which it condenses, if you're cooling it, is the temperature that that would boil at if you were warming it. So carbon tetrachloride has the higher boiling point, which means that it's got stronger intermolecular forces. The intermolecular forces between carbon tetrachloride molecules must be stronger than the intermolecular forces between HCl molecules. Now, this is a little bit of a question it's got a bit of a, you have to think it through very carefully. How do I say that? All right, so carbon tetrachloride, we would expect it to be a nonpolar molecule, right, with only London forces. So sometimes students get distracted by the fact that um, the London forces here are actually stronger, their net effect, than what we're seeing between HCl molecules 
whoever's got the higher boiling point always has the stronger intermolecular forces, regardless of the nature of them. And the College Board keeps asking questions like that. So just be ready. Okay, and that's what you needed to say for one point. So how did you do? Now, this question was scored out of 10 points, and the average score on this question was 5.47 points out of the 10, so about 55%. For a long free response question in AP Chemistry, that's a reasonably high average. This was a very reasonable question, not too hard, a little on the easier side than we sometimes see, certainly very doable. So if you got five or six points on this question, you're right where you should be. If you earn seven or more points, you're doing very well. You should be very pleased with yourself. If you scored fewer than five points, you might want to go back and look at your answers. What can you do to enhance them and make them more complete? To wrap things up, we're going to do more chemistry. Keep coming back. Subscribe to my channel.